Hello, neuroplasticians. I'm excited to be here today with Sonia Pemberton. How are you, Sonia? Doing well, doing well. Happy to be with you and with your uh, community. Very good. I'm happy to be here with you and your jewelry. But let's not get let's not get distracted about that gorgeous piece. So we're speaking to a community of neuroplasticians and neuro nerds and neuro geeks, just like the community where we met on LinkedIn. So give us a give us an insight into your work. Give us an insight into your expertise and just tell us a story about uh, about who you are in your professional and personal environment as much as you like, Sonia. Sure. So I came to the work um, from adult development, really. Uh, okay. Very interested in how we operate as adults, because, of course, in the corporate community is where we mainly work. Yes. Um, some of us, of course, are, are, are independents and others work within organizations. And having spent some time in organizations and really being an observer, I think it's for me, I am a huge observer. I'm, I'm innately uh, introverted. Mm. Uh, most people find that surprising when if they've ever seen me uh, on a stage or, or facilitating. Um, but at my core, I'm an introvert and I do enjoy my own company. I say my best friends are me, myself, and I, us three and no more, but um, I am Very open good. to uh, other relationships. But the adult development world is really, to me, very interesting because we are we are really motivated by things that are going to bring us something they're going to, something that we're very interested in right. and we're, we're not super we're not going to put time into something that we don't think is valuable a valuable skill set for us so if we're talking about mm. the motivation to learn the intrinsic motivation to learn i think we have when we're working with adults we have to figure out in, in corporate situations, because they may or may not be interested in what the mandate is, um, we have to find a way to make it more interesting. And for me, it was looking at, I, I spent a lot of time looking at Susan uh, Cook Gruder's work um, in adult development, uh, how we think, uh, how we act, right? And how we feel. So think we do. And coming off of that, really got interested in how do I craft an experience for adults that will be engaging and also help them to better understand what their resistance is to the change that may be coming, to thinking about the training or thinking about this new skill set in a way that really empowers them and to see it more as an opportunity for growth. Um, and not as an adversary. I have a something I'm going to be putting out early, later on today is, is change your ally or your adversary? And so- when Ooh, I, I love the question. I love yeah. it. And that Can I answer is, it? I Can, I answer it? Can I answer it? Yeah. Well, is it? The, I mean, the, the, the cheeky answer is it's both. Mm -hmm. But But the neurological answer is change is your- your neurological enemy. Mm -hmm. The I, I I don't know if you ever saw, but I did a TED talk called um, "Your Brain Is a Selfish Democrat," and basically the energy expense of a brain is pretty heavy. Um, so energy spent is energy wasted. So change is is energy. So I don't know. Do you agree with me that energy uh -huh. from change is you know expensive? Yes, absolutely. And I think it is inherently change for us as, as humans. Our brain perceives it as a threat, whether mm. it's a person, whether it's an environment we find ourselves in or a specific situation or encounter that we're having. And so mm. if it inherently feels it is a success, it is a um, an adversary, right? A threat, then we have the trigger, what I like to call activation. Our brain then activates a threat response. And that threat response is something that's innate, but can be mitigated. But and, and that, unless you understand that that's what's happening, and I think that's the beauty of the work 
that we're all trying to do with uh, adults in particular is to help them to understand how we are how we're wired and why do we feel this resistance immediately to uh, something that we perceive to be a threat and how I mean, it's neuroplasticity 101 I mean yes. it really is it really is you know your work in neuro conscious strategy I, I love it um and how the work post changes you've got a good keynote on something like that um so maybe we should get you to keynote with us in some time it'd be really cool but well i tell think me it's about, yeah ahead. no i was going to say i think it for me and now this will then we can probably kick off from here to any other direction you might want to go but i think the fundamentally right our neuroconscious, our which I call the human operating system, which is our uh, our cognitive, our thoughts, our affect of our feelings, and the behavioral our actions and decisions that we make, is at the core. It's fundamental to anything that we do in life, and any any issues that we're having in organizations. Until we understand how to integrate and work, design learning around that design facilitation and workshops around the core issues that are impacting the success of many of the initiatives happening in corporations, I think we're missing the boat. And specifically, when we look at things like uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, when we take an intellectual approach only, um, and we're missing the other two, the other most important in element, which would be the affective dimension, and how we feel. What is that activation? How do we identify it? How do we mitigate it? How do we get deeper to find the core um, cause of that thought process that that uh, actually gives us uh, or activates that feeling that we have around whatever the subject matter might be? And I think that's the crux of the work for neuroplasticians, uh, for people who facilitate groups, for management consultants, for everybody in any aspect of the work that we do for within corporations. Mm, I think this is so That's a interesting. lot. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you've seen Hanskep's work um, around affect, which you were speaking about. Mm -hmm. So I mean, his, um, his work around affective neuroscience is so interesting in describing how affect informs emotion, informs feeling, informs mood. Mm -hmm. um, in the in the change work that you do, how affective? No, no. How effective is the change process at ensuring affective well-being in the individual's experience and change? And I think it's critical, very important, and I think there it, there are ways to do it um, because most people don't want to. That's you're speaking now about vulnerability, right? Um, well, part and, of it for sure. Yeah, and so uh, many. Are and it's back to that. It's back to that threat response. I've got to interrupt you. But you know, mm -hmm. where does threat start and stop? Where does vulnerability start and stop? So I mean, maybe it's linguistic, but I think there is. I think there is a very important point to just ask you about the difference between threat and vulnerability at a neurological level in terms mm -hmm. of affect of neuroscience, but just more so importantly in the work that you're doing in change. I don't know if that's a verbose, unclear question. Well, I think there is a connection of, because whenever, I, I, for me, I believe that threat, vulnerability, vulnerability, and on some level is threatening. So we have that same response because we're we're being asked to be to to expose a part of us that we normally like to keep to ourselves. And so for for many people, not everyone, but for many people, it is going to to manifest, if you will, as a threat. What do, what happens when it manifests as a threat? Then it, we are we also feel that resistance to it or reluctance to do that because that goes off into a whole nother area of social identity and how we're going to be perceived and what people mm. are going to think and all those things. There's a lot to unpack there. We could be here for hours unpacking all of that. But I think it is really important. I guess at the end of the day, what's the most important work that that you, that I can do uh, to facilitate 
a uh, engaging, a psychologically safe environment for us to do the deep work that needs to be done so that we have um, environments in, in organizations where people feel that they can thrive and where people feel that they uh, are prepared on some level for the uncertainty and the change that is un inevitable. And for me, it's helping them to understand what I call that human operating system. It's helping them to understand another piece of my work, our brain states. I, I break them up into three different states, the optimal state, the adaptive state, and the reactive state, then get them oh, to actually understand what's happening for them individually in each one of those states so they can then recognize where they are, so they can then shift to a higher state in the moment, if possible, um, and, and try to avoid being in that reactive state, which of course is you know when <laughs> everything shuts down in the executive thinking center. Um, and everything there is diminished and we don't have that ability like we would have. So we're in that fight, flight, freeze. Um, but this, describe to me, I love the three, the triune brain, if I dare be so cheeky. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the adaptive, the reactive, and the? Optimal. Optimal. So what, what brain state do we spend most of the time in how do we get into optimal? How do we go from adaptive to reactive? Just dive me into the model. In of we go in and out of those okay. states all day, depending on what where we find ourselves, what situation are we facing? And it's okay. very difficult to maintain flow, right? Uh, as the famous mm. uh, book was written on. Uh, but we do have moments of that throughout the day. Hopefully we have some moments of that throughout the day. I believe most right. people operate in the adaptive state and that's between, so we're, I like to liken it to, to a stoplight. So optimal is green, adaptive is yellow and reactive is red. And what we want to do is we want to avoid being in that red activation as much as we possibly can. But we need to notice, again, going back to the affective, which we spoke about earlier, when we're sliding down that slide there, what is happening in our body so we can know where we are? And for each one of us, that's going to be something different. For some people, they're going to have a knot in their stomach. For some people, their heart's going to palpitate. For some people, um, they can't find their words. I mean, there's just many different ways that threat uh, is activated in our bodies. And for each of us, it's going to be different for, for many of us. And so we need to understand us in particular and what that looks like. And then we need some strategies uh, for us to, to move, to, first of all, to recognize and then to shift. And then how do we maintain? We may not be able to go for, from reactive to optimal in the moment, but we may be able to go from reactive to uh, adaptive uh, in a moment. And then sometimes it, it takes a little longer than a moment, but we, as long as we have some skills, some strategies that we can use or some tools that we can use then that, that helps us along. You, know, you, you mentioned psychological safety, mm -hmm. which I think is badly branded, but I'll never tell Amy and the gurus about that. <laughs> Amy would I, not I, like that. <laughs> I know. I think it should be called social, mm. neurological, psychological mm. safety, but it was, it's not very catchy as a name. And the, 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 the thinking is that during change, a lot of the stress is social and that translates into, you know, affective states of dis-ease or fear or, you know, you know insecure, insecurity. So, um, you know, in, in the face of changes, we all want a compassionate, informative leader who's communicating with us and keeping us up to date and, you know, making sure that we are falling short of expectations. And <clears throat> I don't know if you ever saw the work of Professor uh, Dane Leslie. Anyway, it doesn't matter if you have it, but through the, through, through the, the linking around the, the psychological safety, we can see how experiences can be created into new neural pathways and build community around a team if there is psychological safety in place how important is 
psychological safety as a construct in your work? Uh, um, very important. Sorry. Because yeah. you have to hold space uh, for all these individuals, mm -hmm. right? And you have to create an environment in which they have that level of, and I think when we talk about psychological safety, we also need to talk about trust on some level, right? Exactly. What's the mean? <laughs> I mean, I'm going to interrupt you quickly. So does trust cause psychological safety or does psychological cause trust? Because trust is kind of the opposite of fear, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you think... Do you hear my you hear my complicated question? Yeah. I love it the way that you're thinking. Um, I think trust cause trust allows for psychological safety. I'm totally on board with that. Yeah, and I think it's of course it's complicated, uh, and because we're all complicated. But I think back to the original question: How do we? How important is it in the work? I believe it is imperative for facilitators, for coaches, for leaders in general to create that trust so that we then have the psychological safety. And there's a lot that goes into that specifically as a leader mm -hmm. uh, leading a team and how do you create the space or hold the space for all of these individuals who have things happening <laughs> as um, in Floyd's iceberg theory below the surface that we don't know about. Um, and how do we create a space where they can let go of that threat or that that experience that that's then triggered for them in any situation that's requiring them back to the other conversation to be vulnerable and, or be in that affective dimension that as I call it in the human operating system how do we do that for me it's depending on the type of work I'm whatever the, the uh, workshop I'm in or, or leading uh, is to help them find the commonality, help them find where they, where they have the lived experiences together uh, to find some commonality first before we go deep into the conversation. So I use a lot of uh, what I call mediated dialogue and in in-person workshops in particular, so that we are able to um, come to see ourselves beyond what we see um, in front of us, but to really get deep into some of our lived experiences and find the commonalities that we each have there. And then we jump off into, uh, from there into deeper conversations and a little more probing of questions. Um, but the other piece I think is really fun is that how do we come into some of these really deep, um, emotionally activating conversations and keep it in a place where we are engaging in, in a fun activity that then gives us more insight and aha moments, not only for ourselves, but for those that we are working with. And I think that um, is a trademark of- Okay, of so here's, here's a question that I want. I want to ask you a question. There is, there is a lot of talk around fun in the NPN Hub. And I really want to dial into the, the question of optimal state mm -hmm. and relationship to fun. There's some really cool people looking at the use of humor. There's um, some really interesting research around the fun habit, which is a book which we'll tell you about later. But, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the question is this, Sonia to have an exploration around your, your optimal um, model within a conversation and, you know, drag all these other people who are speaking about fun and optimal state and humor and flow into, into this conversation. Are you, or would you be up for that kind of conversation sure. in the, sure. okay, let's do it. Okay. I'm going to stop here because I know that you're running out of time, but so am I, but I think this is going to be a hugely important integration slash conversation around how we can join the dots as we journey on the road to Mecca together in the brain. I think it's <laughs> great. I will, I'd love to leave you with this, uh, what I call the change equation, because at the, at the end of the day, we're all talking about right, change. Right. Different Please aspects do. Of change. change equals opportunity plus growth. When we can get that as our foundation around change, 
and get people buying into the opportunity and the curiosity that equals um, that that adds growth to who we are, who we are becoming. To me, that is change to see change in that way as an opportunity for growth. So opportunity plus growth equals change. And that, that makes it an ally and not an adversary. I wanted to throw fun into your equation, but we'll leave that for the Yeah, well, we table. can put that in there too. <laughs> I didn't have uh, that in there, we'll but leave, we could we'll put that, that in there. But this is such a fun conversation. So Sonia, thanks for dialing in. We're going to have good conversations together. I'll see you in the NPNL. Thank you, my friend. Take care. Thank you. Bye.